Good morning. Certainly been good to gather together with you to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. What a good place it has been uh, to be already. I want to thank the worship team and the choir and all those who just helped prepare our hearts to come to the Word. Uh, boy, the invitation there uh, with that last song, Come. That's what we want to do this morning is to come before the Lord Jesus Christ and to see him in all of his beauty and all of his glory. And uh, that is certainly our hope and our heart this morning as we have come together. Uh, if you are visiting with us this morning, I certainly want to welcome you. Uh, <laughs> this is what will be representative of what you will hear each week, but we really find ourselves in unfamiliar territory. Uh, typically, I'd say almost 99% of the time you come through these doors, we're working our way through a book of the Bible together. And a couple weeks ago, we finished up the Gospel of John. And uh, so for the month of December, we're going to turn our attention towards Advent and just focus our hearts on, uh, on Christmas over these next several weeks. And then at the beginning of the year, uh, we will we'll have a short topical study, uh, one that I believe will be very helpful for us as a faith family. And then uh, following that, we're going to jump right back into a verse-by-verse study. And so uh, just kind of give you a little bit of an idea about where we're heading. For this morning, if you can grab your Bibles and turn with me again to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10. And some of you who have just been through this long study of the Gospel of John are thinking, How's this all that different? We're just looking at the life of Christ again this morning, and that's true. Um, and, and really, the, the motivation behind this this morning is twofold. Number one, uh, since we have finished up the Gospel of John, those final words, the final command of Jesus to his people has just been ringing through my own ears. All right, day after day, it seems almost, I hear, I hear the words of Jesus from the end of John's Gospel, follow me follow me. And, and that has been, in my own heart and life, uh, extremely helpful. Uh, just there, you know, and, and what that means, right? To deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. And that means there are days, and there are moments, and there are times where you're going to cross your will, and you're going to do what God wants you to do, and not what you want to do. And that can be hard, can't it? Uh, I've, I've fought that battle numerous times throughout the last couple weeks. Um, times where the Lord is, is just saying, yeah, this is what you're going to do. And there are times where uh, I found myself gladly submitting and other times where I found myself grudgingly submitting to the will of God. And, and that's to my shame, but that's the reality, isn't it, that we fight. We fight our flesh. And so part of that, as we come to Mark chapter 10, is we're going to see what it looks like to follow Jesus once again. Uh, but the second reason I want to come here is this is, for me, one of my favorite Christmas verses, right? and, and I know you're thinking, well, Mark doesn't even deal with Christmas, right? Like, it's, that's Matthew, and that's Luke, and Mark just jumps right into the ministry of Christ, but the truth is, the, the story of Christmas really, it runs throughout the whole of Scripture, right? The promise all the way back from, from Genesis that God would send a Messiah, that he would send a Savior, and, and just goes all the way to the end where we see that Savior has come, and he's accomplished that redemptive purpose, but in Mark chapter 10, in our scripture meditation, we read this morning, He came. He came. That's Christmas, right? And, and so that's what we want to focus on this morning. He came not to be served, but to serve and give His life a ransom for many. And so we're going to use this, this to kick off our, our Christmas focus as we prepare our hearts uh, to celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so we're, we'll do that in, I think, probably the, the best way we can. And that is we're going to gather together as a church family around the Lord's table this morning. We're going to remember the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And, and again, if you're visiting with us, i just like to remind you, we, we, we practice what is known as open communion. And that means that if you're, if you're here with us this morning and you're not a member, but you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you've put your faith and trust in him to save you, then we would invite you to join with us this morning. Uh, now, if you're here this morning and you have not yet put your faith and trust in Christ, you're still considering who he is and still weighing out whether you want to follow him, then I would just encourage you to listen closely to the word of God and pay close attention to the service as we celebrate communion uh, because it paints a beautiful picture of the gospel, the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for you. 
All right, so we're going to just ask the Lord's blessing on our time in his word, and we're going to make our focus primarily Mark chapter 10, verse 45. But I'll give you the context uh, before we get there, okay? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for just the sweet privilege we've had of gathering together here this morning. Uh, Lord, it's been good just to, to be able to seek your face and call upon your name to hear your word read, and uh, Lord, also just to sing your praises. You are truly worthy of all honor and glory and praise. And the truths that we have heard this morning are a comfort to our hearts. Lord, that though we are unfaithful and though we are broken and bitter and hurting, we can come. We can come to you, Lord Jesus. You invite us to come. You tell us that your burden is easy. So, Father, I pray for those who have a heavy burden this morning, whether it be the burden of sin or the, the burden of hurt and pain, Lord, that today they would come and they would experience your peace and your grace as only you can give. Lord, I pray for us as your people that we would, Lord, just combat the, the cares and concerns of, of this world, particularly at Christmas time, as we feel the, the pull of, of what the world would want us to think Lord, I pray that you would help us to see Christ once again, to fix our eyes on him, and as we leave this place, that we truly would be a people who follow. That this mind that was in Christ Jesus would be in us. So help us this morning, I pray, by your Spirit. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, and amen. So if you look just very briefly with me at, ch- at verse 32 of, of chapter 10, I'm not going to preach this passage, but I want you to see it. It says, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Now they were afraid because following Jesus to Jerusalem was a dangerous thing. The people in Jerusalem wanted Jesus dead. And if they were associated with Jesus, they would want them dead. So that's why they're afraid. And it says, it says they took the 12, Jesus took the 12 again and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Now, it said there that that Jesus took them again to explain. In fact, in Mark's gospel, this is the third time that Jesus has pulled his disciples aside, and he's explained to them what was going to happen. You just imagine, right, him gathering them around and saying, okay, when we get to Jerusalem, they're going to they're gonna arrest me, they're going to beat me, and they're going to kill me. Right? And it, he tells them this three times, and every time Jesus tells his disciples what's going to happen, they, ha- they have an argument. <laughs> right? they're, they're, they don't hear what Jesus is saying. In fact, right, at one point, Peter takes him aside and says, no, Lord, that's not, that's not the way things are going to go down. Right? And, and, and Jesus says, you know, get behind me, Satan. Right? No, this is God's plan and God's purpose for me. But here in Mark chapter 10, the argument goes something like this. Lord, when you establish your kingdom, I want the best seat. Right? That's really what happened. James and John go to Jesus and they say, okay, Jesus. And they, it's just like they just tune out everything he just said. When, you're, when you get on your throne... Can I sit on your right hand and, I, and I'll be on your left hand? I want a front row seat for what you're going to do, Jesus. And what does Jesus say to them? You don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. In fact, to be on Jesus' right and left hand when he accomplishes the purpose of the Father would have meant what? They would have been where those two thieves were hanging. You don't know what you're asking. You can't, you can't do what you're asking to do. There's coming a day... James and John, where you will drink this cup, but it's not now. Jesus alone could accomplish this purpose. All right, and so there, understand that what James and John ask of Jesus has nothing to do with his kingdom. It has everything to do with theirs. All right? It's all about self-promotion. It's all about position, right? 
And this is exactly the way we operate, isn't it? It's about the glory of self. It's about what, how I can advance myself. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's not how the kingdom of God operates. Right? That's the way the world operates. Right? The world operates in a way in which right, those who are in power and authority, they lord it over. Right? They raise themselves up and they put others down. And Jesus says, that's not how the kingdom of God works. In fact, the kingdom of God is upside down, right? In the, in the kingdom of God, to go up, you go down. That's how it works. Jesus lowers himself, lowers himself, condescends to the lowest possible position. And he says, that's how it is with us, brothers. Do you, did you see it? Let me just remind you there in, in verse 42. Jesus explains it. He says, you know, those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Their great ones exercise authority, but it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Make yourself a servant. You want to be great in God's kingdom? Then you make yourself a slave of all. How's that for an invitation? Right? You say, I don't know if I want to sign up for something like that. This is the way God's kingdom works. And if you want to follow Jesus, then you're going to have to lower yourself. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. We have a hard time with that, don't we? I certainly do. And so this morning, you know, we're looking at this Christmas verse, and it's not so much about the way in which Jesus came, right? That's what we do in, in Matthew and Luke. We talk about the baby being born in a manger and all the details surrounding. And it really is remarkably incredible that, that Jesus would come in that way. That's a, that's a part of his condescension. But in Mark 10, it doesn't just tell us how he came, but it tells us why he came. He came not to be served, but to serve. And, right, two separate, and to give his life a ransom for many. So we want to unpack that this morning. Jesus is just going to help us to see what does it look like to follow me? Why did Jesus come? Why do we celebrate Christmas at all? So in verse 45, it says, even the Son of Man came. The Son of Man. Now that is Jesus' most um, popular way of referring to himself. You'll see him again and again refer to himself as the Son of Man. And certainly, there's a sense in which that refers to the humanity of Christ. That's significant, and that's important, right? That, that God came as a man. But it's more than just referring to his humanity. This term, the Son of Man, is rooted in the Old Testament prophecy of, of Daniel. And I, I think it would be helpful for us just to look back because you need to see it. So Daniel chapter 7, and we're looking at verses 13 and 14. Right? Daniel 7, beginning in verse 13, this term, the Son of Man, is rooted here in this vision of Daniel. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now, there is a whole lot there to unpack, and we're not going to just, we're not going to break it down fully, but there we see that term, the Son of Man, and we see that the Son of Man is given what? All authority, all dominion. He's given the right by the Ancient of Days, by God, to rule and reign over who? All peoples, all nations. How long? Forever and ever and ever. So this Son of Man is a man, but he's not just any man. He's the God-man. Right? This is the, 
This is the one who has existed eternally with the Father. This is the Word who became flesh. This is the Creator, the Sustainer of the world entering into His creation. This is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It says He came. He came. That is remarkable, right? I don't know. Have have you ever been somewhere where somebody of great importance showed up? I I, I really, I'm not that, (laughs) I haven't been in very many great important places where important people wanted to go. But I, I, I know when they come, right? Everybody pays attention. When they come, all eyes are focused on them. But the way in which Jesus comes is very different. This King of kings, this Lord of lords, the creator and sustainer of the universe, he came. He didn't come to the palace. Right? He came to the manger and he lived. He lived in this obscure little village for much of his life. I mean, by all accounts, it would have been a very insignificant life had it not been for those three short years, right? Right? Three short years that changed the world, changed your life and my life. The king came. And and, and I think it's it's important for us to recognize that the king didn't just come. That The world is filled with stories, myths, and legends of gods who came, right? Who kind of came into the the world and they they interfered with the, the lives of men in different ways. Is, is the story of Jesus just another story? Is he just another myth or legend? Absolutely not. All right. Now, man, we could go and we could see how this is rooted in history itself. But for this morning, when those myths and legends come about, it's always about the God who's coming in, right? They serve Him. They worship Him. And they are bringing about their will on the people. But here, in, in, as we look at the account of the incarnation, Jesus comes, He becomes one of us, and He makes Himself a servant. It's not about what He wants, right? It's about what He has come to accomplish for us. Very different, right? Very, very different. So the the Son of Man came. That's the incarnation of Christ. That He took on flesh. And I think that's significant for us this morning. Particularly if you're here this morning and you're hurting and you're struggling. I I want to remind you that we do not have a God who is far off. We have a God who has come near. Not only has he come near, but he has become like us. When it says that he took on flesh, that means that Jesus made himself weak and vulnerable like us. Jesus was tired. And he got hungry. And he felt pain. Jesus lived in this sin-cursed world, taking on the fullness of humanity. And anything you've ever felt, he felt. So much so that in Hebrews chapter 4, it says that he was tested in all points as we are, yet without sin. That, that, That what you have experienced, we have a God who has experienced and you know what? That's good news, isn't it? Because he can say, come to me, and he knows what you're feeling. If you're hurting this morning, Jesus knows what it is to hurt. If you're in pain this morning, he knows what it is to experience pain. If you have been hurt and betrayed, Jesus knows what it is to, to have people who are close to you turn their back on you. He knows. We have a God who is not far off, but a God who is near. A God who came. He took the initiative. Not only did he come, but notice the way in which he came. It says the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Right? Now we made mention of this already. Right? This is upside down. This is not 
what you would expect. If the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords showed up, then you expect everyone to bow down to him and everyone to serve him. That's what you expect, right? (laughs) You do this. You do that. You get this. And it says that Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. That word has the idea of doing the most mundane mundane of activities. it, It literally means to crawl around in the dirt. Right? It, 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 the idea was somebody who waited on tables, who swept floors, who did the dirty jobs that nobody else wanted to do. It says Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. This is the humiliation of Christ. We see the incarnation, he came. The humiliation, he lowers himself, right? He comes from the highest position in glory and brings himself to the lowest position on the planet. We saw in John chapter 13 when Jesus took the position of a slave in the house and washed the feet of his disciples. So what does it mean that Jesus came to serve? Well, there's no shortage of examples, are there? We see Jesus feeding the the hungry, healing the sick. But, But if we want to really just boil it down, Jesus sees needs and he moves to meet needs. Always, right? Always we see Jesus moving to meet the needs of others. He did not come to be served, but to serve. Do you recognize and realize that this morning that you have a God who lowered himself for you? He served you. In fact, he is still serving you. You say, I thought I served him. You can't serve him unless he serves you. Here we see Jesus lowering himself, condescending to meet the needs of others. And there's no greater need, brothers and sisters, than what we find at the end of verse 45. Not only did he come to serve, but he came to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came, he was born, But he was born to die. He came to give his life. Now, for that to make sense, we have to understand what Jesus is saying here. Because that word ransom for us, all we think about is like kidnappings, right? There's a ransom letter and there's a price that needs to be paid. And that helps us to understand what Jesus is saying. When he says, I'm giving my life, he's saying, I am going to pay a price to set you free. There's a, there's a price that is necessary for your freedom. And that could be confusing for you this morning. Because maybe you're thinking, I'm pretty free. Right? I, I don't really need someone to set me free. But that's not what the Word of God tells us. The Word of God paints a very different picture of your life. You listen to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 34 Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You say, what did Jesus come to set me free from? He came to set you free from your sin. Everyone who practices sin is a slave of sin. All right, you say, preacher, you don't really know me. You can't can't label me like something like that, like I'm a sinner. I don't have to know you to know that because the Bible calls all of us sinners. And, and, and so by, by the fact that you are a sinner, the Bible also says you are enslaved to sin. <laughs> it's not good English, but you can't not sin. Apart from Christ, you are in your sin and there is nothing else you can't. You don't have to be, you don't have to be an addict or an alcoholic to understand this. You're a sinner. And and there's nothing else that you can do apart from Christ. Listen, your biggest problem is you. You say, Pastor, that's not fair. Well, let me just make it fair. My biggest problem is me. 
You see? You see? Right? My own temptations, my own desires, my anger, my fear, my lust. It's my biggest problem. And until we realize that our biggest problem is in here and not out there, we'll never know ourselves rightly. Isn't that what we like to do? We like to blame our, we like to blame our sin on other people. I know I shouldn't have done that, but (laughs) they did that. I I know I shouldn't have done that, but you see the the culture, the society that I grew up in, it conditioned me to live that way, to think that way. And, And the Bible says, no, the problem's not out there. The problem is in here. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because of our sin, we are, we are enslaved. We are in bondage to sin. And guess what? The wages of sin is death. Now, that's not a surprise to anyone, I know, right? To, you know one day you're going to die. The Bible says the reason you're going to die is because you are a sinner. But maybe you don't fully understand the weight of what that means. When the Bible says the wages of sin is death, it does not just mean that you're going to die physically one day. It means because you have sinned against the God who made you, you are going to die spiritually. A spiritual death means you are separated from God. Because of your sin, our sin has separated us. God is holy. He is righteous. He has not sinned in any way. And because of our sin, we're going to die, yes, physically. We'll die spiritually. When we stand before God, he'll say, depart from me. And apart from Christ, you will die eternally. The Bible says you'll be separated from God forever and ever and ever. Eternal death in a place called hell. That's the worst news I can imagine. But isn't that what Christmas is about? This is the condition of all men apart from Christ. And yet, he came. (laughs) And he came to serve. And he came to give. He came to give his life as a ransom. He came to pay the price that we deserve. This is good news this morning. Yes, sin and death are linked, but Jesus came to pay our ransom. If you knew, right? If you knew this morning that you were bound for hell because of your sin and that there was a ransom necessary to set you free, right? There was a price to be paid. And if you paid that price, you'd be delivered from hell. You would do whatever it took, right? You'd do whatever it took to get that ransom, to pay that price. Like eternal hell, no, whatever it takes, I'll pay it. Here's the thing, listen closely. It doesn't matter whether it's children in here this morning or you've been in church your whole life. You can't pay your ransom. You can't do it. Lots of people are trying. You might be trying this morning. By the very fact that you're here in church, you thought, man, if I go to church, I'll get some points. Right? We like to think about, that's religion, right? I just gotta, if I do some good things, then God will love me and he'll let me into heaven. But that's not what the Bible says at all. The Bible says because of our sin, we will be separated for God, from God forever and ever. You can't pay your ransom. But do you hear the good news? He came to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus does what you and I cannot do. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one God and one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. And it goes on to say, who gave himself as a ransom. You see what that means? The price that needed to be paid to set you free and deliver you from the penalty that you rightly deserve, Jesus paid. He paid it. We sing this, don't we? When we sing how deep the Father's love for us, 
The final, final line of that, that beautiful hymn, Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Jesus, by what we read in, in, in verses 32 to 34, right? By, by going to the cross, by suffering and dying and, and being buried and raising again, Jesus paid the penalty that we deserved. This ransom was voluntary, right? He gave his life. He gave himself, right? No man took his life from it. He laid his life down. It was a voluntary sacrifice, a voluntary price that was paid. It was a valuable ransom. If you think just for a moment about what Jesus is saying here, the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many. That means that all, all who would come to him in faith can receive this, this forgiveness of sin. It cost God his own son. First Peter talks about the, the precious blood of Christ. That was the cost of our sin. The infinite son of God, the eternal one who existed in eternity past, who came, he alone could pay the ransom. He alone could set us free from our sin. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The only means by which you can be right with God and you can have your sin forgiven and that ransom paid is to put your trust in the work of Jesus. That's the good news of Christmas. Yes, we rejoice and we sing, right, that he has come. But unless you see that he came to die for you, then you don't understand Christmas fully. If we look at this passage together this morning, brothers and sisters, I want to just backtrack just for a moment. Because Jesus here has said, in verse 43, it, it shall not be so among you. What is he talking about there? He's talking about the, the world, right? He's talking about the Gentiles who lord it over others, who place themselves on a pedestal. And they lower other people to make themselves higher. He says, that's not, that's not the way we're going to operate. He said, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be great in my kingdom, you must be a servant. And then he says, even the Son of Man came to serve. I can think of no better parallel to this passage we're reading than Philippians chapter 2. In verse 5, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Right? What did Christ do? He humbled himself. He lowered himself. Right? It, it, it's a remarkable picture, is it not? It, it says, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus, he, in his incarnation, he lowered himself. During his ministry, he made himself a servant. And in his death, he condescended even lower. In this verse, in, in, in Mark 10 says, this is the way it's going to be for you. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be a servant too. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. We have the greatest example of humility before us this morning in the person of Jesus, who was the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Son of man God promised would have authority over all men, and yet he lowers himself to the position of a slave, and he moves to meet the needs of others. And then he says, if you want to follow me, then you're going to do it too. You, you understand what that means, brothers and sisters? 
Jesus took the initiative. He's the one who came. He's the one who moved to meet needs. And so for us as a church, we want to be those who take initiative, right? We want to be those who have our eyes open and who are looking for needs to be met. Everything about the way the world celebrates Christmas causes us to look inward and, and get our eyes off of others and get our eyes on ourselves and on the material things of this world. But, but here, the example of Jesus says, I want you to get your eyes off of yourself and I want you to look for the needs of others. To lower yourself. This is the call for those who would follow him. If you are a believer in Christ, this is your call. This is what we need, church. We need, we need a church filled with servants. People who have, have understood what Jesus has done for them. And because they know what Jesus has done for, him, for them, they too are willing to humble themselves to serve others. This plays out in countless ways. Behind closed doors, right, where nobody will see. You see the need of someone and you move to meet the need of someone. It may be a financial need that you say, I can help out with that. It may be a physical need that you say, you know what? I can, I can get you a meal. I can, I can help out in this way or that way. There's needs that you see that, that need to be met and you move to meet the need. That only happens as you lower yourself, right? As you humble yourself. You don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. That has to play out in the context of the body of Christ here. We want a church filled with servants. People who have experienced the grace of God, the forgiveness, who have been set free and now set free to serve others. And you start to see the needs around you. As you enter these doors, you see brothers and sisters who are hurting and you come alongside them and you, you hold them up. And you pray with them and you partner with them. You see ministries that are in need and you say, you know what, I'm gifted, I can help in this area or that area. The Lord has burdened my heart to move and help here. I'm going to tell you right now, church, we have some incredible opportunities to serve. We have a van ministry that is busting at the seams right now. Praise the Lord. But because that's true, we have, we have immense needs over in the, in the activity building on Wednesday nights. We have a student ministry over there that is just stretched thin. And they could use help. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should do that, but somebody should. There are needs, and God may burden your heart to meet a need. That's just one of many. If you're looking for ways to serve, Oh, come see me or one of the elders. Pastor Troy, we'd love to point you in a direction where the Lord could use you here in the body of Christ. And I, I always know, when I, mention, when I mention needs like this, there are some of you, you hear a message and you're going, man, I got to do that. And usually the people who hear that the loudest are the ones who are already serving. And so I, I, want, I want you to hear me this morning. If you are serving already and you're giving of yourself, I'm not asking you to give more. But the reality is that there are some who are doing a whole lot of taking when it comes to the body of Christ and not pouring back in to the church. The body can't operate like that. Every part of the body is meant to contribute. Look at the example of Christ this morning. He lowered himself. He humbled himself. He gave of himself. First and foremost, that we might be set free. And I recognize that may be the greatest need of someone here this morning. You find yourself in bondage, enslaved to sin, and God is just convicting your heart this morning. Not only do you recognize your sinfulness, but you feel trapped in it. 
You feel like there's no hope for you, no help for you. And I want you to see this morning that Jesus came. He came for you. He came to give himself that you might be set free. You say, what does that look like? It, it looks like believing. It looks like trusting. You recognize your sin. You see your need of a Savior. And you call out to him this morning, right now, where you sit, say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. I need you to set me free. Now, if you're someone who feels like you need that forgiveness, we would love to talk to you more about how you can know Christ and walk with Christ in your life. But for us as a church this morning, as we come to the table and we enter into this, this season, we want to fix our minds on who Jesus is, on what he has done, and we want to follow. We want to follow. So as you eat of the bread this morning and you are reminded of the, the Son of God who came, as you drink of the cup and you are reminded of the great cost of your sin this morning, let your heart be moved. We're going to close out following our, our participation around the Lord's table by singing together, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. The last words of that hymn says, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul my life, my all. Your salvation was costly. And that kind of love moves us to follow. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege we've had to gather here, to hear your word, to see the example of Christ. We trust this might prepare us, Lord, as we enter into this Christmas season. And right now, in this moment, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to take opportunity for us to prepare our hearts to come before your table. You have warned us in your word not to come in an unworthy manner, not to come with sin unconfessed, not to come with unforgiveness or bitterness in our heart. So right now, I'm going to invite my brothers and sisters to pray with me. Just in the quietness of this moment. To come to you in prayer. To confess their sin. We acknowledge, Lord, that our greatest problem is in here. It's in us. But our great hope is outside of us. Our hope is in Christ. And as we come before you this morning... Oh, Father, we pray that you would forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In this moment, brothers and sisters, take the opportunity to pray to the Lord.